Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Grisha Stewart. Grisha M.A. CPDTKA is an author, international speaker and dog trainer who specialises in dog reactivity. She runs Empowered Animals LLC and the online Animal Building Blocks Academy from Deadwood, Oregon. She founded and ran Ahimsa Dog Training in Seattle for 13 years, earning many awards including Best of Western Washington. Ahimsa is a Buddhist doctrine of of non-violence to all living things, which reflects Grisha's focus on empowerment to promote the well-being of dogs and their humans. Her latest book, Behaviour Adjustment Training 2.0, New Practical Techniques for Fear, Frustration and Aggression, was published by Dogwise in early 2016. Her popular second book, The Official Ahimsa Dog Training Manual, A Practical Force-Free Guide to Problem-Solving and Manners, was published in 2012 and updated in 2014. And her popular BAT 2.0 a DVD series about empowered socialisation and training was released in the same year, 2014. Grisha has a master's degree in mathematics and graduate work in animal behaviour. She is an enthusiastic and entertaining presenter who creates her seminars to accommodate a variety of learning styles. So without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to welcome one Grisha Stewart to the show today, who is patiently waiting by. Grisha, good morning, good afternoon to you. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Ryan. It's uh, I love where I am in Oregon, but it's a shame I'm not in New Zealand. I love it there too. <laughs> yeah, it's... Beautiful here in New Zealand for anyone out there in podcast land who hasn't been here. Uh, it is a beautiful country. I do feel somewhat isolated occasionally. We're pretty far away from everything. <laughs> yes, it was actually the most grueling uh, intake I've ever ta- I've ever done in terms of flying into the country. They're like, "Do you, have you been hiking? Are there any seeds on your boots? I mean, it's, uh, they're very specific because it is an island and not overrun with a lot of things. Yeah, every, a lot of people say that if you are coming here, uh, be prepared to have clean boots <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yep. and and leave your seeds at home. <laughs> hey, we're going to get started and dive into the first question today, Grisha. Could you please take everyone listening back to where you first got started, where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training uh, and share some stories. We love stories here at Animal Training Academy. Share some stories of some of the first animals you ever trained using it. So, well, it, the the very, very beginning was probably just uh, teaching the dogs that I had and the uh, the dogs of the people that I babysat how to jump over agility jumps using treats or motivation. And I think I did a lot of jumping over the jumps with the dogs and, and praising them for that. So it, uh, yeah, it actually turned out there was a, there's an organization that does agility in the Northwest in Idaho and the... The lady, who, when she was off doing agility, she had uh, a daughter, and the daughter needed a babysitter. And so I babysat her daughter, which I we actually found out many years later, uh, she didn't know she had a babysitter while she was gone. So that was kind of interesting that the husband had had me babysit without her um, 
for knowing that. But anyway, so, so, so I worked with her agility dog as well. She was gone. Some of like the ones that were not competing. So, and then fast forward many years, my actual real introduction to positive training came from, uh, I got a dog and my boyfriend at the time was, we were both in graduate school for math. Well, I was for mathematics and he was there for computer science. And he said that before we got a dog, we should read some books. And so I read about 50 dog training books because that's what you do when you're in grad school is you get really good at reading things fast. And so I read a bunch of books, wrote a little like a book report on each one. We had a discussion. I got a dog. And then we went to a class actually that used uh, a prong collar. So she had the, the trainer was like, this is like power steering and I had read in some of the books that it was okay and some of the books that it wasn't. So I was still kind of not ethically sure of where I stood. And so I actually did use one for about uh, six days and then realized that that was not the relationship that I wanted with Spoon, the dog I was working with. And um, so then I, what I started doing was just experimenting with positive training. I had a, uh, so outside of the class, I had a juice lid that made a little popping sound. And so I used that as my first clicker. And the first thing that I taught her was to turn her head and look over at my, my boyfriend at the time. And uh, so I was just like, this is amazing. Like you can reach inside her brain and communicate something to her without showing or, you know, that you can, you can actually communicate. So I was pretty much sold at that point. And then I started, started taking classes at the Humane Society, which had positive classes and uh, eventually then volunteering there and working with the dogs there. So, and actually, interestingly, many years later, after I had started a HIMSA dog training and, you know, we had 40 classes a week by that time. And one of the students who came through was my old teacher. And so I was able to teach her some more about positive training. So that was kind of a nice full circle experience. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so, what was it? What was the time gap between jumping over agility hurdles with your? <laughs> it was quite a gap, actually. So I was, I think I was probably twelve or thirteen when I was babysitting, uh, and and then it was oh I don't know, I'm going to say twenty five. No, yeah, probably twenty five when I was uh, starting to to do classes with Spoon. And what was your original? life plan because you're studying maths you got your master's in maths yeah so my original plan was to get a phd and teach at a at a university and then what happened is probably that, that i got the dog somewhere in the middle of that and so uh, i i ended up deciding that i i would rather teach human beings that like who are really interested in kind of a, a crux of change and so i i got out at the master's level and started teaching at a community college. I got a tenure track position there. But then that same time, I also started um, my business as a dog trainer. So by then I had already gotten that passion going. So I was teaching just you know one or two classes a week, renting from a, a dog daycare and teaching. So teaching math during the day and doing dog training at night. And then so for that whole first year, it was ramping up and up and up in the dog training business. And then um, still working full time as a mathematician, and so I ended up taking a, a year leave of absence after that first year from the from the college, and diving full head, you know head on into the dog training. And then by the time that year was up, I decided that's all I really wanted to be doing. Wow! And that was fifteen years ago. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think you've kind of added some uh, new potential meat to the term behavior nerd, um, reading, <laughs> reading 50 books. What, what, so that was about 15 years, 15, maybe more, 15, more than 15 years ago. You were with like the, at with stage. the books. Yeah. Yeah. So that was probably 15 years ago. So, so what, what was some of the, well, that was no, so the books were probably 17 years ago. Cause the, yeah. yeah 15 yeah. was why I started the business. So what were some of the seminal books at that time that you think, you know, was it was it one book that you read that kind of still sticks with you to this day? Uh, well, definitely Patricia McConnell's books uh, were huge for me. Um, so I, let's see, I read the, I think Family Dog Training was one of them. And she was actually my very first seminar I ever attended was, was one of Trisha's. And it was great. I, I took Spoon to that. 
And I remember she was trying to identify breeds and do some like study. And so we, I volunteered her for that because Spoon was like a blue eyed Basset Hound Border Collie mix. So they were, that was awesome. But yeah, so, oh, the other book I remember at the time was one that I, I fell for at the time, but then realized was not reasonable uh, was uh, The Dog Listener. Uh, so Jan Fennell. Um, so that was a book that I, it was all about, like, you have to eat before the dog and, you know, kind of standard dominance based stuff. But it was without the force part. It was sort of psychological dominance. And so that made at least sense, like more sense to me than the throw the dog on the ground aspect. Uh, but then, of course, that turned out to not be necessary either. And so you read the books and then you additionally we at the same time, or kind of after that, I guess. So 16 years ago. Uh, sure. Taking, <laughs> take, taking so I'm sp- a mathematician, not a, not a historian. <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. Taking Spoon to, to some classes. Mm-hmm. And someone told you that, a, you said a prong collar is like a, like a power like, like steering? Like power steering, yeah. Oh, so wow. Yeah, which at the time kind of made sense right because you actually then are able to steer the dog with much like f- less force on your part but that's because it's stabbing into the dog's neck so they're like ow and, and so it's a lot easier i'm putting an air quotes here but like easier to turn them but not, it's not easier for the dog so like the work that i do now with that using a harness and a long line and all of that that's really power steering. I mean, that's mm. the sense of like just using this very light touch to be able to direct a dog. And that's the idea, you know, like, I mean, so power steering makes sense, right? As an actual term, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. like, you know, old school, it was manual, right? So you had to really crank on the wheel in order to get the car to turn. Power steering makes it much more simple. Like anybody can do it. Yeah. And so that's and, the idea. And from so. the historian point of view, I guess 16 years ago, that was like <laughs> not commonplace. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Power steering was just coming in as well. No, I think it had gone, been in for a while. But my, my car at that time, I think, did not have power steering either, to, to be fair. So, so. What's, what's the 2018 metaphor? It's like saying, because um, you, you, we've changed it to power steering is um, kind of like using bat. But we could say like 2018 model is like positive reinforcement is kind of like having a smart home. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be a metaphor in there somewhere. I'm I'm not sure I'm going to make up a good one quickly. But yeah, a lot of times I say, though, that bat is like meditation. So Mm. it's really about reducing arousal so that you can have good decisions and, you know, kind of inserting, this is to quote Viktor Frankl, but it's inserting a space between stimulus and response. Mm, Don't think we've had that on the podcast before. Yes. Excellent. First. So Victor Frankl, remind me, is a, is a guy who survived Holocaust the Holocaust. survivor, yeah. 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 And his book is called Man's Search for Meaning, is it? That sounds good. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to quote so, you on that. So we've got uh, this word that I, that I had a, to double check with you that I was going to pronounce right, which is ahimsa. Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? Mostly ahimsa, yeah. <laughs> ahimsa. Uh, yeah. And, and so that, as we as I mentioned in, the, in your bio, is... Uh, Buddhist doctrine of nonviolence to all living things. Yes. Uh, and you f- you think about that kind of like meditation now. You said. So how's, how how important is this kind of like your your can I say your spiritual side? Mm-hmm. Sure. And 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 how how important is that to like how you think about what you do with dogs and your training? It, it's super key. It's it's everything because the way that we are in all of our interactions is the way. That, that reflects who we are, right? So we can't be simultaneous. And to my view, we can't simultaneously be one way with our dogs and another way with the rest of humanity. And and so it's as I almost, I feel like we treat our dogs like we treat our inner child. And so as we become more self-aware, I think the way that we interact with our dogs is also different. Uh, and I also, I think we can learn a lot by the way that we we. Yeah, by the way that we interact with our dogs and the, the, the voices that we project on them. So the things that we think they say about us, just like with anyone we love, it really reflects more about us than it does about them. So, um, and I think that it's important to have a scientific perspective. So we're, you know, we're getting data, we're making sure that our techniques are working, but that we're also in touch with how this fits in with our ethics and our spiritual side, because I think that's important too. Yeah, and I think I'm going to kind of, 
come back to some of this later on in the podcast and talking about how we how we talk to ourselves. Um, so let's let's shelf that for now because I, I I want to kind of unpack it a bit more, but I think we'll, we'll do it in a more strategic fashion later All on right. in, in the recording. Strategic. Um, <laughs> we'll see how we go. So let's bring everyone up to speed now. Thank you for sharing all of that, uh, and just maybe build upon. Because I've already mentioned it. Because who is this person there. anyway? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> build, build on where you are now, what you're doing now, and where people can go to find out more information about you and get in touch. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I I teach seminars and I also teach online. I have online courses that are like self-paced. And then I also do an online school where there's about, I think, 200 hours of video as well as Um, a Facebook group and some other content, that kind of thing. There's different levels. There's one for professionals and one for students. And that's all on my website, which is just my name, grishastewart.com. Smart. Yeah, right? It took me a while to get to that. So I I, I actually... I I like inventing things and I like change and I like progress. And so I realized after after having like three or four different websites that I need something that I'm never going to change because otherwise I have to keep redirecting. So pretty solid on my name at this point. So yeah, that's why I went with that. Watch out for www.thedogtrainer, formerly known as Chris Stewart. (laughs) There we go. Once I change my name to a symbol. Yeah, uh, and we, and we will link all of that in the podcast write up as well. And yeah. online I had some courses. of my music in there too. Uh, I I don't have a ton of music. I'm not an amazing musician, but I have a song about that that's in there. Uh, ah, cool. So, yeah. Can we share that song? Sure. Absolutely. Not right now, it's on YouTube. Sh- yeah. No. Share share it in the podcast <laughs> write up. I don't um, have my guitar. No, you're quite you're quite into music as well. So on your on your Facebook free page, mm-hmm. you uh, shared one of your friend's songs recently, yep. which was nice. Yes, he's much more talented than me. Well, <laughs> let's say much more experienced. How about that? So. Uh, we've all got we've all got imposter syndrome. Yes, right, That's right. right. <laughs> uh, so you've been doing online stuff for how long? Uh, see again with the numbers. I don't know, <laughs> five years, let's say. So um, yeah, so I, I started my school I think three or four years ago. And I really enjoy it. I like being able to reach people all around the world and not uh, put quite a strain on the planet and and my own body as well, right? So if I go for a weekend seminar, then it's actually like four or five and sometimes six days of, of getting there, right? So there's the travel, there's the decompression, there's the speaking and all that. So it's great to be face-to-face with people, but it's nice to have something that's a little bit lower energy so I can do more. And you're telling me when you caught up, month or so ago that that you kind of manage your life in different stages now so you go through periods of intense kind of travel Mm -hmm. and then periods of long periods of decompression at home Mm -hmm. exactly and it gives me a chance to write uh so i and and just to work with my own dogs and to be in my forest and which is amazing (laughs) to have and yeah it's uh we really, I think there's a, a culture of busyness, and we we mentioned that a little bit before we started on air here. That I think there's a little bit of a competition of like who can be the busiest. That busyness is success, and it isn't. I mean, so it's uh, it's a way to just um, we overproduce, and but the quality in terms of what we do and for our own souls and the connection that we have with people that goes down when we end up being so busy and. And so really I've put a, an emphasis in the last, at least the last three or four years on uh, quality of interaction over quantity and being able to say, these are the places where I excel in communicating and have making a connection and that it feels really good to me. And these are the things that I need to cut out because I'm not able uh, to you know, be 100% committed to it. And I have lots of ideas and I love coming up with new things. And so it's very hard for me to say, no, let's, this is a project I need to tell someone else about so that they can get all fired up about it and do that instead. But I'm not the person to sail that ship. Awesome. I love it. Uh, And I am thinking a lot about these things now myself. And I look forward to the day when I can say, I just want to be in my forest. I yes. very much look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you, get, if you get a chance, uh, one of the books I really like, which I end up getting, I think, as a referral from Kathy Sadeo, was it's called Essentialism, Greg McEwen. Okay. 
and it's a it's a really good book. There's there's actually I'll just plug my own site actually now that I think about it. There's an interview with him on my site. He's not a dog trainer, um, but uh, I did like a series of little interviews with various professionals that I found useful. And uh, but yeah, he his approach is really good. So just kind of paring down to the essentials of where can you contribute most to society. Where do you feel the best, and and what can you, what do you have to say no to in terms of the rest of it? Yeah, and thanks for putting that in there. No, no relation to John McQuiggan, obviously. No, yeah, and actually McEwen <laughs> is his, his last name, so no relation to Teresa McEwen either. Oh, uh, McEwen, so, or McEwen, oh, sorry, yeah, McEwen. <laughs> yeah, McEwen. I think is how he says it, and McEwen. But right. anyway, yeah. Uh, and it's not the first time we've had potentially a book which. People might class as similar mentioned in the uh, podcast. Sarag Patel mentioned uh, Eckhart Tolle's "The Power of Now," which kind of is mm, more love that taking us yep. away, taking us away from dog training, but not mm-hmm. uh, right. It's and, all related. Yeah, cool, awesome. We'll link. To, I'll link to that. Maybe if you can send me uh, the exact URL okay. for that um, interview, then we can link to that if anyone wants to find out more. Uh, well, thanks so much for sharing everything so far, Grisha. I'm, I could do a whole podcast, I think, just learning about people's behavioral odysseys, as I like to call them. So appreciate you sharing. Moving forward, though, I'd really like to talk about BAT. So okay. Can I, can I leave it there? Can we just get going? How about we start with how did, how did BAT get started? Well, what is uh, BAT? Yeah, what is BAT? So BAT stands for Behavior Adjustment Training. And the way that it got started originally was – so I had been training using positive training, working with reactivity cases and uh, my own dog, Peanut, my soulmate dog who passed away a couple of years ago. He was basically, I had him at the point where we could, he had issues with kids and dogs uh, and men and bicycles and anything really uh, when he was younger. But uh, I had worked through the bicycles with classical counter conditioning. And then in terms of the men and the kids uh, and the kind of, all humans really, uh, he was to the point where if he was in working mode, if he was paying attention to me, then he would look fine. Like we could heal past someone. Uh, he, I wouldn't necessarily need to be giving him treats at the time. He could, he could still be functional as long as he knew I was paying attention. But the moment that he was like off the clock, if he was just wandering around or, you know, loose leash walking next to me, then his reactivity distance was actually more like 50 or a hundred feet. So much further, uh, so about 30 meters for those of you in meters. And so it was, you know, embarrassing, right, as a trainer and also sad because that meant that he's having a really hard time. And so I was looking for other tools. I uh, I discovered um, CAT at the time, Constructional Aggression Treatment. And that is a technique that is, it's a based on negative reinforcement. It's not a technique that i that I would necessarily do um, anymore, but it's also the way that I did it uh, even then was pretty, was less aversive to the dog. So it was still had a, a component of flooding, which that that technique does have. And so basically as soon as I started doing it, I was like, well, why am I doing it this way? Why, why do we set him up to bark? Why can't we just start further away? And why is he not the one moving? And so let's move him further away, let him be the one that approaches the trigger. So there were various components of that technique that I was like, oh, I'm not so content with this. And so I started tweaking it more and more. And then I, I presented it to the people who did uh, that technique and as potential changes and they were like, yeah, no, um, good job coming up with your own thing, but that's the, no, we won't do that. And so kind of jokingly to amongst my, like between me and, and a friend, we were like, let's call it bad. Like, and so I just made up my own name for it. And then that kind of stuck. So, um, yeah, so that's where it started. And so that was the original version of that. And then over time, little bits have been tweaked. And then there was kind of a, uh, a moment in 2000, 13, toward the end of 2013, when I decided that the, that the technique needed to be upgraded. And just to rewind actually a little bit. So with that, then basically what I did was I worked Peanut through his issues with people. Um, and he ended up being a therapy dog for uh, a senior center, which was great. So he really started to enjoy petting. He had about five or six people that had ever touched him before we did this kind of work with him. 
And when he was doing counter conditioning, it was like he was had amnesia. So we could work with the same decoy over and over and over again. And he would just like, it would be a new one every time. And when we started doing, um, doing this without the food and just using distance, he, he definitely remembered them. And so his progress was a lot faster. So anyway, should I continue on with that? Okay. So back to the 2014, end of 2013 part. So I was teaching a five-day course and I realized that people were still putting their dogs over threshold, like even by day five. And so it had me thinking, like, why is this, right? So if, if people are doing something wrong, it's either there's something wrong with the technique or it's something wrong with the edu- the instruction, right? So it's it, it can't be everybody is stupid, right? And so you immediately, you know, I look at what can I change, right? And so I did a couple of things. So I did, I watched a ton of video about, uh, of, of setups uh, and then just dogs in general interacting and watching for what's the biggest tell that the dog is going over threshold. And so what I saw was, was basically that the straight line approach was the, the biggest one. So as soon as they aligned the spine, that was the key that everything else was going to go downhill from there. And so that's how we now distinguish where the threshold is. And obviously, if the person sees any other behaviors for that dog and says, now we're starting to get over aroused, that's also considered threshold. So we would do what I call a slow stop and keep them from going closer to the to the trigger. So that's one thing I did was, was watch all those videos. I also did a lot of reading, just as I did with the, you know, the 50 books before I got Spoon. So I read a whole lot of... Uh, scientific research, looked at the literature and tried to figure out other ways, uh, look at the underlying mechanism for why BAT might be working and realized that it wasn't so much of the negative reinforcement aspect of moving away so much as the opportunity to just have control of the situation. And so I amped that up in the new version of BAT and it made it so, and it was the control, but also just the experience, just the the ability to, to see the stimulus and have a expectancy violation where they expect that there might be something dangerous and then it turns out it isn't. And to really get that experience versus um, having it be really brief. And so I, I realized back to the threshold part that um, it was very reinforcing for people to put their dog over threshold. So what was happening is they would go in the old version of that, they would walk the dog toward the trigger wait for the dog to disengage, mark with yes, and then move away. So that yes, or the click or whatever, that moment was very reinforcing for the human. And so the human would seek that out over and over and over again. And so that would, um, yeah, that ended up making it. So we were pushing the dogs to be over the threshold. And so now what we do is the dog, we just follow the dog, essentially. It's a very simple version of the technique. So I simplified the instructions as well, uh, which I think make them more effective as well as um, also just easier to understand. All right. So to recap, okay, thank you, you. <laughs> you, uh, you found out about CAT and you took, which was, what was a, sorry, remind me of Constructional um, aggression treatment. Constructional aggression treatment. Uh, okay. And then you, you implied it and found some kind of modifications that you thought were beneficial. Um, and so you took it to the, the CAT team uh, and they were like not really our thing and so you jokingly turned it into bat Mm -hmm. (laughs) and here we are Uh, and so you you started implementing workshops and found that the dogs were continuously being put over threshold right so yeah then that's jumping forward quite a ways right so that was i did more work with clients and you know ended up writing the book and then the workshops but yeah but yes, now that takes us to the end of 1.0. <laughs> and so <laughs> twice in your life now you've realized the necessity to gain information. Uh, and one thing that comes, because I suck at reading books, Grisha, because <laughs> I'm so air quotes, because I hate this weird podcast audience and we're going to delete it out of my vocabulary very soon. Busy. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, maybe you need audiobooks then. I, I do, I do. It's, the yeah. challenge is the books are, some some of the books you really want, they're not on audiobook, right? So Yeah. But, I would call that um cognitive dissonance right there. 
<laughs> because there are a lot of really good books on audio. Ah, uh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to want to um, read the books written by people like yourself that are is 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 bet on um, no. people like yourself being yeah. podcast guests and people that I've come into contact with. Um, gotcha. All right, well, just put a request out there to... Uh, <laughs> I have been thinking about it, though. Audify. So, yes, Audify. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you, you did a lot of uh, stuff with clients, and, and that brought us up to the end of 2.1, oh, sorry, 1.0, uh, when you realised that... Is it is it then that you realised that either something was wrong with the teaching or something was wrong with the people? Exactly. Yep. And I took, at that point, I took a month off of everything. So I like doing a yearly sabbatical where I'm not doing any training or working with clients, anything, and I'm just learning something new. And so that was my focus for that year. Oh, that's awesome. I'm learning so much just about life. <laughs> 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 yearly sabbatical note, right? Right, because uh, we work in the business so much that it's really nice to take a break to work on the business sometimes. And so some of those sabbaticals, I'm looking at my business structure. Some of those sabbaticals, I'm looking at when I'm teaching. So, yeah, very useful. I love it. And I kind of want to just talk about sabbaticals now, but we won't. I'm going to stay on. <laughs> we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to stay on space. So, and then so you realize that, a potential um, kind of generic way of looking at a dog about to go over threshold was you align the spine. Well, they align the spine, not you. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, don't, you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> towards the trigger. Um, and then so you've made modifications since then um, to kind of am – I, am I heading down the right track here? Mm -hmm. I kind yep, of... Yeah, and, and to be fair, I, I wasn't the very first person to notice that spine alignment thing, but really I think – putting I think I maybe put a bigger emphasis on it than other people do now because I think it's really the main one and then um, unpack this term a little bit more for me you, you then talked about uh, is it expectation violation mm -hmm. so, so un unpack that a little bit more yeah so expectancy violation is basically it comes from human psychology as well so uh, let's say you have a phobia of spiders and so if you see a spider your brain is catastrophizing. So it's thinking the spider is going to jump at me or like all the expectation that it's going to go terribly. And then you look at it and you realize actually, okay, that's a cartoon spider. So we're going to be cool here. And so your heart rate has a chance to, to lower down to the, the normal rate. And, and so you, it's, it, it's actually built on the idea of cognitive dissonance. So there are two thoughts that are dissonant. There are two ideas, which is spiders are, safe and they're not safe right so they're very different and so um or that i'm safe or i'm not safe right for example and so you have the dissonance of now i thought there was i was going to be not safe but i am safe and so then your brain looks for a reason why am i safe in this situation and so at first it's going to be like okay because it's a cartoon but as you do more conditioning so you would do like you know a real spider that's dead or whatever and like build your way up to it then it generalizes more and more and more and so it creates this new paradigm so yeah so it's it's basically it's how we learn and when therapy works it's really that's one of the main ways that it does work so if you look at um uh oh coherence therapy it's a type of psych a psychology for people and that's really about kind of pulling out the the baseline, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the baseline statement that we have that we can then have in contrast with our reality. So I'm, I know we're going down a whole rabbit hole, but I really love mm -hmm. this stuff. So I'm going to I'll yeah, mention it quickly. So with coherence therapy, basically, it's um, let's say that you had some trauma as a child with men. Right. So like maybe you're father was angry so you have this paradigm if you take it down to like what the two-year-old self would say is like yelling men are dangerous right so some very simple statement like that and you kind of figure out what's the one that resonates the most that kind of build, brings some emotion out in you and then you really kind of allow yourself to sit with that and feel it and don't push it away and don't say like well that's stupid even if like your brain is like yeah no it's not they're not actually dangerous. And so then you sit with that, but then you have the expectancy violation. You look through, after that piece, you look through like memories of your life or a recent experience and say, 
well, did I ever see a, an angry man? And I wasn't actually in danger, right? And so you can kind of get that, those two experiences simultaneously, and then it ends up rewriting the rule. So you get some memory reconsolidation from that. And so this is kind of a way of looking at it, and therefore then we can take that information and kind of uh, start to think about what might be going on for our dogs. Exactly. So in terms of our dogs, so they're, I mean, they obviously don't have the the thinking about the event in words, but they do have the expect, expectation, right? So if they see another dog, they expect that they're in danger. They react as if they're expecting they're in danger, at least. I have no idea what they're technically <laughs> expecting. Uh, but then if you can create a scenario in which they see that trigger and yet the, they're, it, they're completely safe, and that's usually because we've, they're much further away, we're allowed, you know, they, but um, anyway, you create this scenario where they're safe and then their arousal can go back down to the point of, you know, just exploring the area, then we do have some of that expectancy violation as well. And so I think that's part of what's happening with that. And so you, you am, I, am I correct here? Tell me wrong, because I, t- I told you before the show, I've, I've known a bat for so long and I've ordered my bat 2.0 and the post lied to me, people, they lied to me. It's not here. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't uh, teleport it to you. Darn. <laughs> no. Uh, and, but I've done my research and so I understand that. And, and once again, maybe I understand wrong, but so tell me, there's kind of three areas you focus on. They're lease skills, set up, and survival. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Can you walk yep. us through those? Sure. Uh and actually, before we do that, I just want to make sure to clarify something I just said mm-hmm. in case it's mm-hmm. it's unclear for people. So with Bat, we're not uh, creating scenarios where the dog is like, oh, my God, it's a dog, and then freaking out and then calming down. What we're doing is creating scenarios where it's like, hmm, I see trees, I smell bushes. Oh, hey, there's a dog. And, yeah, I smell trees, I see bushes. So it's just like a non-event almost for them. So mm-hmm. we don't want something that's hugely... Um, exciting for them. Now with humans, when they do um, a lot of this work with expectancy violation, they actually do cause more of an arousal spike. But I think because the humans know what's happening, that that works, but I don't know that it would necessarily work or be ethical to do with dogs. And so that's why we work lower arousal. So, um, but anyway, back to your question. The, yeah, so there's three main pillars of bat, and one is the leash skills. So to be able to use uh, a 15 foot or five meter leash in a way that uh, that allows the dog to feel as off leash or free as possible, and then also um, makes it so that everybody's safe. So people aren't tripping over the leash, the dog's not stepping over it, people aren't getting rope burns, that kind of thing. So I've broken it down using tag teach as, as how to teach each individual skill. And that's been really useful. And then the other piece is survival skills. So things that you can just do on your regular walks that are not quite teaching for bat, but it's allowing the dog to stay more below threshold during those walks. So they're not getting into trouble. And it's kind of like triage. So immediately the people have some skills that they can use so that their dog is not embarrassing them (laughs) uh, or freaking out on the walks. Mm. And, um, and then the, the the real change that happens from the setups, which are facilitated by those leash skills. So effectively, basically, we have the dog on a, a five uh, meter, 15 foot leash on a harness. And we're just wandering around an area that happens to also have a dog or whatever trigger in it. And it looks like the dog is basically just looking for a place to pee. It's just, it's super boring. I, I have a trainer who calls it boring aggression treatment. And uh, so you just wander around and our job is to be a parachute. So to use those leash skills from time to time to say, all right, looks like you're kind of approaching in a straight line toward the trigger. So we do a slow stop uh, and wait for the dog to disengage and then we go back to following. So that's the, the main human role and so for people who are used to doing dog training that are really into control, it can be hard to like take a step back and say, I'm going to control the picture for the dog, but then let the dog have complete choice within that picture. It's very empowering for the dog, but can be kind of uh, at first a little bit um, feel like you're not doing anything for the trainer. So, Yeah, I can imagine. And one of the things you mentioned there when you're talking about sit up, I think it was when we're in the setup phase. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you mentioned that it's not embarrassing for the owner. So you're trying to set them up to not be embarrassed. Is that now? I'm, I'm curious about this because you know, 
you know, just from like a marketing perspective. So when we're trying to sell this to people and, and with any marketing, as, as I've been learning about business, um, social um, status is an important touch point when you're trying to communicate value to someone. So is, is that kind of something that you use to kind of sell this to people? Is that what the clients are looking for over like making their dogs feel better? They're kind of looking for making themselves prepared. Uh, raising their social status is that a way of putting it I don't know I, yeah um, I mean I think it's I I would say I, I don't use it enough for the marketing but probably could but yeah marketing is really all about like what's in it for me right and so there's there's a there are different segments of the population so we're in, more in the segment where it's like I am the caregiver of this animal and his well-being is why I'm here right I want him to not feel stressed I want him to feel comfortable um, so that that segment of the population I speak really easily with because that's those are my people. Uh, and then there's the like, I don't want to be embarrassed by my dog, which I, I have to some extent as well. Right. I, I even mentioned that with peanut. Um, and so I think that justifies a lot of punishment that people do for dogs is that they're sort of like people look at them like, well, why aren't you doing something? And so people, you know, grab their dogs or throw them to the ground or lift on their leashes or whatever as a as a, as a show that yes, they're doing yeah. something. Um, so there's that. And then, then there's also fear, right? So people are legitimately afraid either for their dog or afraid that their dog is going to hurt somebody else. And so those are all those components <clears throat> in terms of safety, in terms of having more fun with their dogs. And I think fun is sort of, sometimes I promote that as sort of being the opposite of the embarrassment piece. So, but you could also say a dog you can be proud of, right. Would be calling upon that. Um, piece as mm. well mm. and and uh, i also think that oh sorry go ahead no, no you go uh, i also think that a lot of uh clients come to us as their dogs are like their first kids right so they're learning how to parent through dog training and i think that we should be very mindful that the tools that we give people are then creating the kind of children and adults that we want into, in society because they're going to be using these tools on their kids too so I That's think, cool. Yeah, and I think so. I think we need to be really careful about creating addictions, personally. We talk about that <laughs> with um, animals and in zoos about showcasing what we're doing so that our zoo visitors go home and share it with their dogs so that they then teach, treat their kids better. <laughs> exactly, oh yep. Um, so we're just looking at time. God, Ryan. Um, well done, Ryan. I'm, I'm trying to reinforce myself, not punish myself. There you go. About Good job noticing on, the time. There we go. <laughs> on, live on the podcast. Uh, before we move on, just maybe for people that are dealing with uh, reactive, aggressive, uh, fearful dogs uh, and, and they haven't heard of bat or they haven't um, thought about trying bat before, uh, obviously going out and, and looking at your website and either purchasing a book or looking at the DVD options, uh, what, what are some other simple tips, that you, just one or two simple tips you can give the listeners of the show that might um, want to start to think about this new way of uh, dealing with some challenges they're having? Uh, let's see, a couple of quick tips. One would be to film everything. So film all of your sessions so that you can go back and figure out what you would change, uh, how you would improve that. So definitely filming. Uh, and also a lot of people have formed that Facebook groups for their communities. So either create one or find one. I have a directory of those on my website under chat groups because that's a really good way to, to find other dogs to practice with. I know it can be challenging to find decoys, either humans or dogs. And so bat is a technique where you can have both dogs have reactivity and be working with each other uh, doing that. So, and actually, can I jump in for one other thing? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, just correcting you slightly because I think yes. Susan Friedman would want me to. Of so, course. Uh, so uh, I, I don't use the term reactive dogs or aggressive Sorry. dogs. Yeah. Uh, so I always uh, try to put it onto the behavior. So it's a dog with behavior or with reactive behavior for example, rather than a reactive dog, because they're not reactive 100% of the time, but they do have a, a set of their behaviors that's overreactive. Okay, so if you have a or dog that you are hypothesizing fearful. is exhibiting behaviors we might label as reactive. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be a faster way, but yes, dogs with, with aggressive behavior. Yes, the, um, I know it, it's so much faster just to say aggressive dogs, but it's, yeah, it's a good no, habit it's, to get into with our dogs and our, uh, uh, because we also use it with people too, and then labeling them as something, the label sticks. And so, yeah, we tend to do more corrections when it's like the dog is an aggressive dog versus a dog that has an aggression problem. 
that has this behavior under this antecedent condition. Exactly. Uh, with exactly. this reinforcement history. I hear, I hear Susan talking through you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's a great catch, and I'm really grateful that you, you reminded me of that. And uh, we're safe, I think, with the audience of this podcast being behavior nerds. Maybe wrong. I don't have uh, accurate data to 100% back that up. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, important, it's important for us to consistently... Um, Remind ourselves that, yeah, the word reactive is not describing behavior. I think. Or or can not I describing the animal, yeah, so that we're, we label the behavior, not the animal, basically. Mm. At least as far as I'm concerned. Maybe Susan would phrase it differently, but. No, I love it. And thank you for, for adding that little input there. I'm always up to throw some uh, ABA on what we're talking about. Hey. You should um, see me with Susan. It's like I feel like I'm completely being taught. By the end, I'm just like, okay, I shall behave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you so much for sharing that. We can so everyone can find out where where to get more content on this via grissestuart.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, perfect. Um, so once again, we'll link to all of that in the show notes. And you have a little video that uh, I think it's on the homepage of your website, is it? That or maybe it's in the bat section about what bat is. It's like ten minutes long. I watched it uh, this morning. Uh, yeah, I think, and it's also on my YouTube, on my Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. I have an Instagram, but it's not on there. But yeah, so what is bat is definitely in the the Facebook page. So we'll share that video on the on the podcast write up as well, and uh, maybe the the bat song, which I'm excited to watch now. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for sharing. That was. A ton of fun. For our next question, though, I wanted to talk about consent. Can okay. you define this for us, please, Grisha? And uh, it's why you told me it's something you really wanted to talk about today. Right. So I don't know if you've noticed, but the world has gotten a little bit crazy, especially on the, the side of the pond. And uh, I think consent is especially important these days as as we Like in terms of human beings, but also in terms of our animals, right? So I have a a, a workshop or a webinar on my site called Don't Grab the Pussycat. And uh, (laughs) it's it's about ways that we can uh, ask for and receive consent uh, from our animals. And so I'm sure in some of your other podcasts, you've talked about that uh, cooperative care. But I think it's in general also just a really good way to think about teaching children about consent um, I think that we 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 do things to you know dogs and kids that we wouldn't do to adults. Like we make them finish their food, for example. Like we ask kids to like eat all their food, even past the point of the the point where their own body has said I'm full, right? And I think that's a violation of that boundary. Um, so having respectful boundaries that our dogs can set and our and people can set, uh, I think, is important. And so with dogs, for example, uh, we use the, the more please signal. So a more please signal is something like uh, like chin targeting, right? So the, the dog can target his chin onto your hand. And then as long as he's holding the chin target, that means that the counter conditioning that you're doing is something that he's comfortable with. So Bean, for example, will hold his chin on my hand and then I'll look into his ears, give him a treat, look into his ears, give him a treat. And if at any point he pulls away, then I just pull my hand and pull the, you know, the inspecting hand back, wait for him to retarget, and then we go back to the activity. So it's a way for him to, to give consent uh, and also to say, hey, I'm ready for this procedure as well, instead of uh, me just like grabbing his ears. And so is this built into stuff you do in, in bat? Where, where is the, what kind of um, touch points do we have with regards to um, something like you just described with the chin target? Mm-hmm. So with that, a lot of the dogs also have issues with being handled. And so it would definitely be uh, that chin targeting specifically would be part of that. And then I also think just instigation. Um, so where the dog is doing most of the approach toward people rather than beginning, as we often do with counter conditioning, where it's like the people approach, here's a treat, the people approach, here's a treat. And the dog really doesn't have control over that process. And so I think no matter what the tool is, we could people can benefit from learning about that and then applying that philosophy to other techniques. Love it. And I know there's a ton of people who are listening to the show who are going to resonate with this uh, and for whom everything so far is going to be highly beneficial. So once again, thank you so much for sharing. Next, I was hoping to talk about another species, that species being us. 
and appreciating, of course, that all animals are individuals. We're going to talk about the individual now and how we can apply what we know about training and behavior as we started to dive into a little bit earlier uh, to ourselves and our own learning journeys. Grisha, can you talk to this for us? Sure. So I, yeah, so anytime we learn something, right, I tend to to apply this to every area of my own life, and I'm, I'm sure other people do as well to some extent. And there is a really good book called The Power of Habits. That is, it, it, it's one of those that I think that it would resonate with just regular people. But if you're a dog trainer, it's like, you know, my head just kind of exploded in terms of how useful that would be to change my own behavior. Uh, so I had several habits that I didn't want and several habits that I did want to try to have. And I know enough about, you know, behavior analysis to, to really have to have done this before. But it kind of wasn't until I read that book that I, that I really got the idea of, like, setting myself up for success. So it, after I read that book, I, I ended up losing... 25 pounds in about a month and a half. I started walking my dogs more. I started training them more. I started meditating. And all really because I changed the antecedents. So because, you know, we we think of uh, our own habits as really being about self-control and they aren't like our dogs. It's not about self-control so much as the antecedents and what the, that leads them to do. Right. And so, yes, there's a certain amount of self-control involved but we don't have to be like throw ourselves into the deep end of the pool where we immediately are like oh there's ice cream in the freezer you know don't eat it uh so doing things like um obviously you know removing of the various things you don't want to eat but then i also put a note on the refrigerator that said what substitute behavior do i want right so we always look for a replacement behavior that can be reinforced and so i i put as a substitute two substitute behaviors one is go drink some water because that's usually what we do if we're hungry uh, or like that we're actually thirsty, but we think we're hungry. And then I also put look for signs of life as a note on my fridge. And what that means is to go to my window and look outside because I'm probably bored and that's why I'm at the fridge. And so at my window, I have another sign, a little note for myself that has about 25 activities that I could do to entertain myself at that given moment. So I can, exercise, I can play with the dogs, I can play music, I can drink tea, like all kinds of things that don't involve eating. And so it's, I was able to then meet the need, right? Because it's really about what's the craving, right? So that book talks about craving, but it's really like, what's the functional reinforcer? Like what's the maintaining consequence that's keeping that behavior going? And so whether it's, you know, smoking for some people or whatever else, like figuring out why why do we actually do it, right? So smoking, a lot of times it's it's a way to, you know, take a break or socialize or like there's other reasons why people might be doing that. And to be able to get that need met uh, in a way that's more healthy for you is is great. And of course, creating a, a competing habit is the best way to, um, to change behavior. Mm, okay, cool. So... Or one of the best we... ways anyway. <laughs> Well, say, say that last bit again. I, I said one of the best ways anyway, because right. with that, we're not necessarily creating a competing habit so much as reducing arousal. So it's it's like that's a piece of it as well as putting ourselves in the situation where we can be successful. So um, meditation, for example, is probably part of why a lot of those other things were working because I was also in a generally calmer state. And so I wasn't eating out of stress either, for example. So it's... it's- immediate antecedents and consequences because the consequence of you going to the fridge. Mm -hmm. Well, the consequence was the same in terms of a functional category, right? So I wasn't getting the food, but I was getting the entertainment, which is really, I was looking for a distraction. Uh So it didn't necessarily matter that it was food, but that I was getting something. It was kind of like the the pre-set up addition of information when you got to the fridge. Say that one more time. It was kind of like the pre-setup of additional information. Mm-hmm. So it was like the adding and the adding of uh, go to the window. Exactly. And I had another antecedent arrangement, which was that I took the rug out from under, like there, there was a rug in front of the fridge. And so mm-hmm. I could like stand there longer, right, if there was a rug because it was warm. So once that carpet was removed, then uh, it also became a little bit of a different 
stimulus, right? So I wasn't going to my target <laughs> mat <laughs> and standing. I don't think mat was removed. So, yep. It's funny to laugh at it, but then at the same time, like, yeah, right? <laughs> right? It's exactly. We're just <laughs> less furry animals. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on who we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, and so when we were talking uh, earlier, and when I say earlier, I mean oh, two things, actually. And let's start with this one because I've started with it. When we were talking earlier, like a month ago, we talked about uh, sometimes you know, using these tools like positive reinforcement, um, applying them to ourselves, but not just – and maybe your answer has already, has already answered this, changing the external environment uh, to change your internal environment. And, and we're talking about um, you know, like self-talk uh, and – just negative self-talk. Uh, we talked about imposter syndrome already in this mm-hmm. um, podcast. How, how can we use what we know from positive okay. reinforcement and ABA to, to influence that, that internal side of the environment? Mm-hmm. Is it by mm-hmm. trying to trying to intentionally change thought patterns or is it by changing our external antecedents? Mm-hmm. So our, our thought patterns are just behavior as well. So... Uh, so we're we're simultaneously the observer of that behavior and the the person doing that behavior. <laughs> so we try to use it as a consequence, right? But if we if we can pull back and observe more, right? So our our sort of true trainer is the awareness level where we see, oh look, I'm doing that negative self talk again. And so when we catch that, right, then at that level we can say. Like, good job. I just totally caught myself, right? Instead of saying like, oh, no, I did it again, right? And then you just end up in the spiral of the negative self-talk. So actually consider it to be like a clickable moment when you notice that kind of self-talk because it means you can you can catch yourself sooner and sooner in the process uh, because it's really, it's like a behavior chain, right? And so that's one piece. The other piece is to specifically then, you know, replace that with, you know, positive self-talk, right? If if you if you're trying to actually change a behavior, do it in a way like I described before, where you can reinforce alternate behavior. And you don't necessarily need to do it with like even with positive self-talk, but just like getting what you're getting your needs met. So it's it's the idea that you can change your behavior through shame that needs to just go away. It's just not useful. Um, so there's a, a researcher um, Brene Brown, sorry, I'll just keep throwing resources at you, but Brene Brown talks about shame. It's one of her major subjects. And she describes how shame does not change behavior. Like it's not a motivator of, of behavior change. It is, um, well, it changes behavior in terms of like downward spiral, but like not fixing the behavior you were trying to shame. Guilt can change behavior. So guilt is very behavior focused. Like I, um, Actually, something really terrible happened this week, and I messed up. And one of my, uh, so my nephew ended up. One of his guinea pigs died because of a miscommunication and heat and some things. And and so I could have jumped to, to shame that like I'm a terrible aunt or I'm a terrible animal person or whatever else, um, but I didn't. But what I did jump to is guilt. So guilt is, oh my god, I totally messed up. This needs to not ever happen again. Here are some things I can change to so that behavior. It doesn't happen, but not really going along that level of I'm a bad person. And so if you have self-talk in terms of like, oh, well, let's let's not do that again. Like that can be very useful, that rumination up to a point, right? And so it's like finding an actual solution and doing that instead is great. But the when it, when it becomes critical of something that you're like, that you wouldn't normally say to any other person besides for yourself, then then that's the kind of thing that's not useful. Right. Yeah, well, if you think, kind of like do your shame talk out loud, it'd be like, you idiot. Like you wouldn't say that to your child or your, you know, your friend. Right. Maybe some people do say it to their child, but like self-aware people don't. <laughs> so I don't know. Am I making sense? Yes. Somewhat? Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and one other thing, um, and, and the, we're talking about labels a little bit earlier in this podcast, when, when, how people define it and help me define it as well. Uh, it's one thing I've been thinking about recently. Um, and I guess it's different for each situation and each people. But when you're talking about the word habit, like mm-hmm. what what kind of like what does that mean for you? Can you define that for us? 
please. Yes. So a habit is a behavior that has been reinforced to the point that your the process where you decide whether you're doing it or not um, has effectively been bypassed. So there's actually there's research that says that like there's brain activity when the if you if you don't have a habit there's brain activity of choice of like what am I going to do here and that that um, brain activity just isn't there when it's a habit. So it's like your brain is just like, oh, we know what to do. And you just go right to that. So that's, for me, that's a habit is something that you do without really needing to think about it. So it's, is it kind of like an antecedent there and there isn't much cognitive processing? Exactly. To yep. the behavior. Does it, how do we, how do we apply this? Because I, I hear people talking about it with their animals. How do we, how do we take that to our animals? Is there, is there danger in saying the animal has a habit does it does it disempower us somewhat i don't know i so i actually almost see it as a as an empowering thing right so it's because we think of habit as an addiction and we know that addictions can usually be canceled out of people rather than it being like he's he is an alcoholic i, I don't know i guess people still say that but like it's 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 a it's something that's maintained by consequences it's not something mm -hmm. that is inherent mm -hmm. in the being, right? It's not an aggressive dog. It's a, a dog that has a habit of responding aggressively in this scenario, mm -hmm. right? And so we can create a different habit. Right. So we're saying that in, in this antecedent, this dog does these set behaviors that we're describing as aggressive. And, and there's, very, there's very small choice in that gap between the antecedent and behavior. It's kind of just like... Exactly. And so what that does is it allows us to sort of realize that the dog isn't like deliberately doing this, right? It's it's just something that's somewhat out of his control at this point. And so we need to create scenarios that are in the dog's control that look different enough that they're able to be successful. And so because if we if we call it a habit, I think people are also used to their own habits and how hard it is to break them and so or to change them or replace them. And so I think it gives some compassion and empathy for the dogs. And anytime we have that, we have a more effective treatment that we can come up with usually. And it back, you know, in terms of change of human beings, which is to me, one of the, the main things we can do as trainers, right? Is that now that they have seen their dog change a habit that empowers them to be able to change some of their own habits. And of course, that's how we change the dogs, right? Is by changing the habits of the people. I love Which it. I think I trainers love, love, need to think about when we think about why is my client not compliant? It's because they have habits that they need to change as well. And so this book, The Power of Habits, um, mm -hmm. is written by... Robert Duhigg, D-U-H-I-G-G. -G. Okay. And look into that audio book for a future Yes, it listening. is an audio book. Woohoo! Yes. I can actually get to that one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to be fair, so... You know, all of the changes that I mentioned, I had actually, I read the first two thirds of that book and it was like, okay, got it. And ran. So I, yeah. So you don't have to read even the whole book to get all, I'm sure there's more benefit in the second part, but I haven't gotten to that yet because <laughs> well, so we started talking about institutions and I don't really run an institution. So, uh, but like within businesses and that kind of thing. So. So what are some other, was that, was that the main takeaway and uh, was there other significant information that you took from that book that you also applied to your situations? You mentioned uh, taking your dog for a walk more often. Like, So I'm trying to think. So uh, well, I'm going to give a, a piece of advice that wasn't in that book because it just occurred to me. So um, I printed out a calendar, just like a blank calendar using my iCal or whatever. So, uh, and then on each day that I did the thing that I was trying to do, I like colored it in or I, um, you know, wrote on it. But the more obvious it is, like if you color in the whole square, it's much more effective than if you just put a check in the square. Um, because then like across the room, I can look and see, like that's my reinforcer for continuing with the new behavior is to see all of those checks come, or all those shaded in areas. So that's one thing that I, that I would recommend as well as like a chart that keeps track of it. And I'm terrible with data collection. Like I'm a scientist, but I suck at data collection. And so um, that's one thing that I found really useful is that very simple way to do that. Um, but then back to that book, one of the things that was 
was really interesting was a story about um, there's a, a cleaning spray. Actually, I can't even remember the name of it right now. Febreze. So do you have that over there? We do. Yeah. So it's a, a challenge. You have a dog. Um, anyway, so Febreze has a, it like, you know, deadens odor, but it also has its own good smell. And so when they first came out with it, they, it bombed entirely until they really looked at the human behavior and said, how can we use, how can we create a craving for this? And so the way they created a craving was to create a ritual or a habit that basically people sprayed this at the end of their cleaning. So that smell became a negative reinforcer to them that their cleaning process was over. And so they ended up being addicted to it. And so then, then eventually they said, oh, and by the way, it also eliminates odor. But by then they had created enough of a craving in people for the smell of it in the first place that that's why they were buying it. I like it. And, and the other person you mentioned there with the shaming research. Mm-hmm. So Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E, and then brown, like the color. Okay. Oh, and back to the habits book. Another piece is that it turns out that toothpaste, it doesn't have to foam and it doesn't have to have mint in it. Those are both t- reinforcers. They're meant to actually create an immediate reinforcer for the process of brushing your teeth. I love mint, by the way. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. distracted. <laughs> but no, but so yeah. You so mint, mint? Or cin- mint or cinnamon or something that like burns the mouth is actually uh, that's why they're in there as a reinforcer for the, for brushing your teeth. Awesome. Hey, looking at the time, we're going to move on. Uh, to... What we can't talk about brushing teeth. No. Anyway. <laughs> I would um, like I would actually love to do a whole episode <laughs> on brushing teeth. Have you seen some of the videos on YouTube about how you teach kids to brush teeth? I yeah, uh, I saw and Susan one time we had or probably lots of times has had that in her talks and comparing like how easy it is to brush dogs' teeth with training. So it's funny. Yeah, we had one shared at a workshop recently in Wellington, and, and it was, uh, I think I've, I've seen one in Susan's online course years ago, so I don't know if she's still using the same one, but uh, this one was even more horrific, even more horrific, and as a doctor as well, it was like a human oh, doctor, no. and I was like, pin this kid down, <laughs> oh, okay. so let's let's shelf that yeah. <laughs> for, it, for another yes, podcast episode. Sense. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we are nearly at the end, but that's okay because we are heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show, and this is called Story Time. Grisha, can you share either just looking at time, either one story or two quick stories, maybe, uh, from your experience training animals so far and some of the important lessons you've learned along the way? Well, so I guess I'll tell the story about Peanut because I, ha- I know the most about him. He was my dog. And a couple of pieces. So one is when I was a new trainer, I was very, very addicted to the idea of, I guess addicted isn't the right word, but I really was highly reinforced by control, like by getting behavior out of him. So, um, you know, reinforcing him for going over the jumps or agility things or jumping my arms. He could walk backwards about a hundred feet. And so all of these tricks were very reinforcing to me and it seemed like relationship and it is relationship, but that was as he got older and as I got older and thinking about control and getting more control in my own life and inner control, that that became less important to me than empowering him as his own being and being able to understand and have him communicate back to me through his behavior what he's interested in. And so I realized I had created this very strong imbalance toward um, external reinforcers in terms of treats and toys and less so about interaction with his own species and with, with people. And I think that the, the good caregiving really is about maintaining a healthy balance for dogs and not sort of creating this addiction because it really is addiction in terms of toys. For example, he was like Gollum and the ring of power, like my precious, you know, like when the toys would come out and it was, um, yeah, it was later in his life. Then I started teaching him how to be a dog again. And in terms of just exploring the area and saying hello to other dogs and people and that kind of thing. And so that that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is, you know, he he passed away at 13 and a half and we we training is not really the important piece like the, the important piece is the relationship and these animals are with us for a short period of time they are visitors from you know their culture into ours 
And it, when we think about what we're training, you know, whether it's positive reinforcement or punishment or whatever else, I think the more we think about them as their own beings, the more effectively we can, or, or like just a better life we can have for ourselves and for them. And it, certainly it makes it so that punishment is, especially forceful punishment is off the table completely, right? I mean, they're, they're guests in our home and why would we punish them for not understanding our culture? So mm. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to say, um, obviously, sorry about the loss of your friend, Peanut. Um, and uh, at the same time, thank you, Peanut, for, for teaching uh, Grisha and, and for you know, still living on today here in this podcast recording and, and reaching many ears and teaching us lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so a bit of um, sadness there and also um, some appreciation. And the, the other thing I guess I should add is also that his, so he died about two years ago, and I had an, what's called anticipatory grief, like pre-grief for him that for, you know, the, a couple of years before he died, I was, I, you know, was always like, you know, not always, but I would often like tear up thinking about, you know, him passing away. And that it turned out that once he actually did pass away, that there was the pre-grief that was really the harder struggle. Um, so, but that after he had passed away, it was it was a very interesting time of transformation and reflection for me that I could just purely feel sad and allow that grief to be there and sit with it and pass through me. But it would, didn't have the complication that happens from that, that anxiety, the anticipation of their death. And so um, I guess I, for all of you out there that have seen your dogs that, you know, enjoy this time as much as you can and, you know, don't, don't live in that future live you know in the with the time that you have now and that it's not necessarily going to be as bad as you think so and yes it will be sad like i threw up i was so sad so it's or almost it it's you know it was terrible but sadness is not terrible it's just part of life it's just an experience and we don't have to be um upset about additionally that we're sad we can just be sad mm, and i'm not Certain that's going to uh, be applicable to so many listeners of the show, uh, whether you have dogs or horses or zoo animals or whatever species you're working with. Um, so thank you for that, uh, mm -hmm. sharing that last little bit there. Before we do uh, officially wrap up, Grisha, one more thing. Can you just take us all, we, we started with a uh, young 12, 13-year-old babysitter, Grisha. Take us into the future mm -hmm. now. Where would you like to see everything we're doing go over the next five to ten years? I so I would like us to, to go more in the direction of consent, uh, but I would also like just as a, an industry, I'd like us to be regulated more. Um, I would like it to be, I'd like education to be a bigger piece in, in all the, the various countries. I would like some of the tools that are uh, out there to no longer be in use. I, I really like how some countries have actually banned the use of prong collars and e-collars and that kind of thing. And I think that any active, uh, you know, activism we could do in, in the behalf of the animals, I think, is really useful. Um, and then, like I said, I think in terms of uh, my own training, and hopefully, I see a lot of people going in that direction as well. Is in that direction of consent and two-way communication and building up uh, the idea that training can be used for not just us showing that we have control over the dog, but actually. Uh, allowing us to have good bedside manner at the veterinarians, right, where we can communicate to the dog that something's about to happen, they know what to expect, they feel more comfortable. Um, so using training for this, the welfare of the dog and not just for uh, making it easier for ourselves. So I think that's where we're headed. And uh, can I, I'm going to circle back one piece on my website. I do have an article about, or two articles about grief. So for anyone who found that part resonated with them, uh, that there's a couple of articles there that might be useful. All right, when I listen to this back, I'll jot down all of these and make sure we get all of these links for you beautiful people out there so you can um, come and check these out when and if you want to. Uh, we will, of course, link to all of this in the show notes, as just mentioned. But can you just remind everyone listening, Grisha, where they can go once again? Sure. Simply. So my You're website nice. is grishastewart.com, and that's also my Instagram and my Facebook so if they, is that the best way to get in touch with you, is to send you a message from the contact form on that page? 
Uh, the best way to get in contact if you, if you're yeah if you have a specific question about any of the courses I do or that kind of thing would be through the contact on my website. If you're looking for how to do BAT specifically and or if you're doing it, you need like practical advice on your video or that kind of thing. Um, then probably the official Facebook group would be the best way because then you get trainers worldwide that can help answer that. I tend not to always be online, which is part of my own self care. Mm -hmm. And is that is that a free Facebook group or is that part yep. of your? Yeah, yeah I have two groups. I have a, a, a bat Facebook group, and then I have one that's for the online uh, school, so the Animal Building Box Academy. And so both of those are linked uh, from my website, but I'll give you those links too. Awesome, wonderful, and order her book. Uh, and hopefully it gets to you in a timely manner. Yeah, you, there's <laughs> ebooks right through my website that could have gotten uh, there like instantly. Uh, I, I have I used to buy ebooks, and then now I have this like habit. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I have shelves that. and shelves of books. In, yeah, yeah, in addition to my ebooks. So yeah, I hear it's you. reinforcing for me to see like all the actual physical books. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to grab it off a shelf and be like this part, or you can highlight it. Yeah, it's not the same in an ebook. <laughs> Hey, Grisha, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to catch up with me a month ago, uh, send messages back and forth, get your bio ready, send me all the links, everything, and, and jumping on the call with, with me today. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you fairly much. I don't even know what that word is. I just made up a word, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> it's super appreciated. And we, of course, really appreciate all of you out there tuning in today as well. If you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich, consent-rich ways, uh, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the ATA Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening everyone and you will hear from us again soon.